a lot of the patients we see have have incredible stories. Since since this is northern Uganda and, and during that civil war, many of those patients were uh, kind of ambushed and and taken into the bush and and have since come back. So so to hear what they've what they've gone through is I mean it pulls every single one of your heartstrings. And and I we can certainly be, be putting that out more and showcasing kind of their journey and what our counseling and our support is actually doing for them. You're listening to Relish This, the Purpose Marketing Podcast. Here's your host, Stu Swinefort. Hey everybody, Stu here. My guest today is Pavel Repo, who is the executive director of A Fine Mind, which is a really interesting organization that's helping to bring mental health services to Uganda. Pavel explained that on top of all the challenges faced by Ugandans, there are only 30 psychiatrists to serve 43 million people in the country. Whoa, that's amazing. Plus, there's a huge social stigma around mental health care. In the region and in Uganda in particular, making bringing services to those who really need it the most just a huge challenge. He and his team have come up with a framework to provide mental health support by enlisting and training regular citizens to help, essentially crowdsourcing mental health care. It's a really cool idea. We had a great discussion today and the root of what we chatted about came down to viewing stakeholder engagement as relationship building and coming at marketing for nonprofits as an opportunity to serve others first in order to bring them into the fold as supporters later. I really hope you enjoy the show. Here we go. Pavel, happy to have you here on the show today. How are things going? Thing, things are great. It's, uh, it's been a good day. Thank you for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. So you are the executive director of Fine Mind. Is that uh, your only nonprofit that you're running right now, or do you have others? That, that is the, the current kind of labor of love. There was a, a past one called the Wayfaring Band that I, that I started and ran. Okay. But, uh, no, no longer. Okay, well, cool. Well, tell us a bit more about Fine Mind. I did a, a little research, but I, I always like to have have my guests uh, tee it up since they do a much better job than I do. You got it. You got it. We uh, primarily are, are based in, in Uganda, actually northern Uganda, and we provide community mental health services in post-conflict Agago District. Uh, this, this particular area of northern Uganda, or northern Uganda as a whole, was in a pretty precarious situation for for decades. They were in civil war under a group called the Lord's Resistance Army. And during the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, uh, rebels would pillage, they would ransack, mutilate, kill, abduct kids to become child soldiers. And this uh, decades-long conflict impacted the population quite a bit. Uh, this, the, the psychological toll has equally been staggering. So our kind of ethos, what we do is that we try and uh, equip everyday people, non-professionals who don't necessarily have a, a mental health background or a medical background with basic skills to provide uh, treatment for depression and anxiety. Uh, Uganda just has 30 psychiatrists for the whole country of about 43 million oh, people. Oh. <laughs> so, so for them to replicate what we do here in the States is just impractical. So we need to mobilize and leverage uh, people, everyday people. And that's, that's kind of what we, uh, what we do. Wow. You're sort of crowdsourcing mental health care. That's it. That's it. That's well said. I love it. I think that's super powerful. Um, wow. Um, so <laughs> how, how do you guys go about doing that? Is it a, is it a training regimen? Is there just a, a set of protocols you, you walk people through? What's the, What's your, your jam there? Yeah, we, we have a curriculum. We actually adapted from uh, a model, a study that was successful in India, uh, something called the Manas model, uh, caked in this concept called task sharing. So in the States here, more synonymous is, is peer support or peer counseling. But kind of globally, task sharing is the idea that you reallocate the few specialists who you do have available and then you level up, you empower a lesser qualified worker. In that, in that regard, we, we offer something we call a collaborative 
stepped care intervention. It's a bit of a tongue twister, but but uh, the collaborative arm, we kind of focus on the patient, use doctors, use the few specialists who are on ground to provide more oversight and supervision. And then our health workers, these are the folks who undergo uh, 50 hours of training, uh, ad nauseum role plays. We discuss the basic tenets of stress, how someone's psychology impacts someone's physiology, how does uh, depression manifest? How do you actually broach a topic that, that is really you know, taboo and, and has quite a bit of stigma? That's, uh, that's kind of the crux of that. And then the step care approach is the idea that uh, kind of health or mental health care isn't a one-size-fits-all. So, so we start with a, a basic uh, kind of questionnaire that, that uh, allows us to have an idea of where the baseline threshold is within the community. And if folks score above kind of mild depressive symptomology, at that point, we enroll them in, in the steps. And the first step is basic language advising about someone's experience. Second, we bring in the big guns. These are where the doctors can come in and provide medication if it's available. And third, we look at something kind of uh, more interpersonal, problem-based areas, grief, disputes, uh, transitions of any sort, and then loneliness. And then lastly, if, uh, if need be, the the psychologists or the psychiatrists who we do have access to, they're they're kind of taking on more of the complex refractory cases, but uh, but not doing the day to day work. But I hope I hope that's a that's a, that's a bit of a, a mouthful there. But I'm happy to dissect any of that. Oh, it's just fascinating. I, I wow, I I'm just still caught up on the fact that they only have thirty psychiatrists for four point six million people. 43, 43, 43 million. million, 30. Yeah. So wow. a little over that's... a million per. Exactly. I mean, that's L- Liberia has okay. one psychiatrist. Uh, Ethiopia has about 40. So, so although the numbers are staggering, this is actually commonplace in many okay. low income countries. And, and I think that pla- the, the application of this model is really, yeah, it's really neat. I, I think that you, you spoke a, a bit to, kind of the stigma attached to, um, to depression and, uh, and other, I'm sure there's a lot of PTSD and those types of things in, in Uganda as well. And, you know, one, one would expect that, that there's a huge stigma, which is contributing to the problem in that, you know, that's why there are only 30 psychiatrists. So just a really interesting, uh, and, and challenge, challenging challenge, <laughs> as it were. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. It's a uh, scarcity and lack of access and stigma and just, just a, a lack of political will. Uh, mental health care in Uganda is mostly centralized. There's, there's just one national mental okay. health referral hospital um, in, in the country. So us working in northern Uganda, that's about a nine hour drive from, from this hospital, if you will. So we're trying to decentralize, to kind of democratize access to mental health and, and to, to kind of reinvent a field or to, to create new infrastructure is, is exciting. It's thrilling. I think we have a lot, a lot to play with, but no, no real kind of parameters or boundaries. So that, that, that poses its own, yeah, its own well, challenges. Yeah, I can see how there's opportunity there and, and a, lot of, a lot of hard work to be done for sure. So what are your biggest challenges is you're trying to expand your mission and, and be able to help more people and bring more people into the fold. What, what are the things that are you know, weighing on your mind on a daily basis? Yeah, but, but there, there's several, there's, there's certainly not just one. There's, there's a lot of them. Uh, obviously funding, funding, funding is, is tight especially in, in our times right now with COVID, funding, funding is limited. Uh, the, the idea that, that we're tending to mental health and mental health in Uganda, I think both of those are kind of endemic barriers that people uh, inherently have a tough time kind of buying in. I think uh, you know, health generally is supported, but, but in Africa of sorts, it's, it's malaria, it's HIV, AIDS, so mental health is a bit of a deviation. So, so maybe kind of backing up a little bit, I think, I think how, how do we tell the story of what we're actually looking for or how do we package what we do 
in a way that can be palatable to folks so they see the value of the work. That's that's always a challenging kind of sticky point. I, mean, I, I love your reaction of when I when I gave gave a little bit of an introduction of what we do, but we often get that, and and people are really excited, but but they're kind of like, well, how or why why mental health or why Uganda? What about what about this? Um, so so we have a tough time kind of finding finding our our place uh, and and speaking to to folks' as hearts and and kind of getting their support to to advance our so would that be in the fundraising zone primarily that your that that storytelling challenge comes yeah yeah the the fundraising totally totally i mean i I think a lot of the foundations that we speak with as well mental health isn't a program or focus area typically it's poverty eradication or economic empowerment or, or, or women empowerment so so we we have to the spin sometimes what what we do in order to fall under those and and uh, certainly mental health impacts all of those that's that's a little bit of a, a a heavy lift occasionally to do that just to get to what what they need to hear so so better better packaging better storytelling how do we actually put our message out there to attract funding is is kind of the the the, the point that I'm always okay spinning about well, let's see if we can unpack some of that actually today. Um, find find <laughs> some ways to uh, to maybe help with that storytelling piece. Is do most does most of your fundraising happen here in the states, or are you? Is it an international effort? What's uh, tell me a little bit more about about that source? Yeah, m- most most in the states uh, there are kind of international funders that we've we've approached uh, that, that are based kind of all over. I mean, embassies in, in, in Germany and in, in Denmark, uh, but, but again, the fair amount here. Uh, ideally, I'd love to get to a point where a, a fair amount or equal parts is funded in Uganda okay. since the work is based there, but that's, that's a bit of a stretch at the moment. Okay, cool. What, and when, when you engage donors, are they typically – repeat donors are they one time big small what's the is it just a total mix of of all sorts of of opportunity there yeah at the at the moment mostly mostly individuals a lot of uh, a lot of friends and family who have kind of uh, mm-hmm. believed in me uh and and like the vision like the dream want to support that we're we're slowly kind of breaking through some of these bigger foundations but uh, but that's that, that's that's been uh, a tough a tough kind of nut to crack, if you will. And I think certainly in the landscape with COVID, even even harder to to break through with them. Gotcha. And I'm assuming you're looking at at aligned foundational work um, that's either Africa centric or mental health centric or or you know, some some kind of alignment when you're out trying to bring in. You know, either corporate sponsors or or um, foundational donors. Is that how you're you've been approaching it so far? Yeah, you're spot on. Absolutely. It's kind of keywords: Africa, mental health, international development, community health workers. That's that's a, a buzzword right now. Generally speaking, uh, a couple of organizations, Last Mile Health, and there's Partners in Health. Those those are kind of the pinnacle. They use a community health worker model. So so typically. Uh, looking at other organizations who who kind of lean on that same apparatus, who funds them, and doing a little bit of mining um, and seeing if there's complementary funders who could potentially uh, jump jump to us and support us a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I think um, you know one of the things we see a lot with the <clears throat> the advent and the and and the uh, growth of corporate social responsibility for for. Uh, in one bucket and certainly when we're looking at um kind of you know social social responsibility marketing and cause marketing is what that's typically called is really trying to figure out how to create alignment so if we're talking with a a for-profit business who's looking to try to figure out who to partner with from um from a cause marketing standpoint, we, we 
really look to try to align with something that that makes sense to either the internal team or the client base or is aligned with just kind of the regular stuff that that particular business does on a on you know as part of their standard operating procedure right and hopefully you know a, when you get great alignment it's it's aligned with all of that so your your internal teams on board your clients understand why you're making this you know this connection and then you can tell that story um, from a, a cause marketing standpoint so thinking about that from your perspective in terms of coming at it from the opposite direction how can you start to try to create selection op- opportunities wow. where you're kind of going out and actually selecting potential partners um, from the, from the nonprofit standpoint and um, and and just really starting to think through and 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 hyper target uh, those types of opportunities and then just start making connections with with aligned uh, foundations groups businesses particularly in people who are in, you know, maybe that B Corp space um, and, and really, you know, attacking that from that perspective of, of, of pure alignment. No, that's, that's a, that's a very astute um, observation. We, we, uh, as, as you were saying that my, my head immediately went to kind of corporations or businesses and we've actually not, not done too much, Outreach for corporations, but but I think that's that's untapped, um, especially I think with the climate that we're living in, workplace wellness is gaining steam, and I think reaching out to corporations who do prioritize that, I think I think could be um, kind of a, a place for us to potentially attract additional funding. Um, so I, I appreciate you making that that comment. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that you know the mental health is on everyone's mind. Particularly in in this year, where <laughs> we're really super challenged with, um, you know, everyone's making adjustments to how to how to handle social distancing and and perhaps you know prolonged um, isolation and, and things of that nature. And so, you know, there's a lot out there in the in that space right now. Just a lot of noise, um, noise in in a you know in a good way as well as potentially a challenge. But um, at least people's minds are on it. And so it gives, it, it opens up an opportunity for you to, to bridge the gap from this is a, a personal problem that I'm having today to, wow, this is actually a much larger global problem that people experience on a potentially incredibly higher level. And really create an opportunity for both individual donors and, um, you know, and co- potentially sp- corporate sponsors or foundational um, people who, who may not have a real understanding of how, how this is affecting people in other countries um, to, to really hop on board and, and get educated about some of the challenges that are, that are being faced by people internationally. So, you know, facilitating opportunities to tell that story and tie it to a, um, you know, to, to an event that is, that is even more personal. Um, are, are you, are you guys doing any, any type of story, storytelling in that fashion, um, with, you know, blog posts or other outreach? We, we are, but, but I think certainly could be doing more of it. Uh, a lot of the patients we see have, have incredible stories, since since this is northern Uganda and, and during that civil war, many of those patients were uh, kind of ambushed and, and taken into the bush and, and have since come back. So, so to hear what they've what they've gone through is I mean it pulls every single one of your heartstrings, and and I we can certainly be, be putting that out more and showcasing kind of their journey and what our counseling and our support is actually doing for them. I think often when I when I share the story of, of our work or how we kind of got the start, I'll I'll usually plug in my story. I've I've had OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, since I was thirteen. Uh, my my first memory of it was when I was standing in the bathroom and I, I I began to wash my hands, and I couldn't stop. 
I, I would wash for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and this would happen multiple times a day, weeks at a time, because I was clawing to just get this, you know, this just right, right feeling of them being clean. And OCD has has stuck. I mean, it hasn't it hasn't left. It's only evolved. It's uh, far far smarter than I will ever be. But I've developed a skill set at this point. I think strategies to kind of be above it, mostly. And and I think that arguably has been the biggest catalyst to to this work because me being here in the United States, we have incredible supports. And and certainly there is stigma, but but you're much more free to discuss it. People who can you know, handhold and, and therapy and so forth. And when I look to places like Uganda, they they don't have anything. And I I truly feel called, beckoned to to do something about that because if it, if it is, it, it's been so hard for me here, I can't imagine. I just simply can't imagine how difficult it can be for people in Uganda who don't have nearly the supports that I do. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story. I think that, that the vulnerability that you demonstrate is, is a, a, a clear indicator of, of your, not only your passion here, but also just your, your desire to, to affect change. I, I commend you for, for, for sharing that. And, and yeah, it's, um, you know, I think that people do tend to lead with, you know, the heartstring stories and sometimes potentially mm. miss out on opportunities to just, just educate. And that's where I think taking mm. your experience and tying that to people, people's experiences here and, and maybe taking some of the things that you have put into play in Uganda in terms of kind of this group, um, you know, group group support dynamic and and educating people here around that that idea might be an interesting way um, to kind of get your foot in the door in terms of you're not asking for people to necessarily jump on to this particular campaign right away but you're just trying to provide uh, insight and and education in in that space and so instead of coming at it from from I mean, success stories are great. And I think that whenever, you know, whenever we have those compelling, you know, impassioned stories around, you know, around someone's journey through, um, you know, mental, mental health challenges, wherever they might be, um, I think those are important to tell, but also thinking about how to add kind of an educational component to, to some of your, some of your outreach might, might be a good thing to, to consider. Right. I, I agree. I, I, I agree. I think it's a, it's a fine balance. Um, and I don't think I've quite struck the right chord with that. Uh, be, because I think right to your point, mental health, uh, what, what I'm thinking about, I was reading a, a recent article, uh, research about mental health. They were essentially saying that it's, it's abnormal for us to not have uh, some sort of mental health challenge in our lifetime. All of us, whether it's severe or temporary, you know, the extent of it, we will, we will struggle with something. And, and kind of, you know, to your point, informing folks about these different approaches and the utility of it here, I think could, could kind of open up some ears to, to a different thought and uh, gain some attraction for our work in Uganda and certainly even see if it could succeed here. Although, We've had some struggles to to kind of implement some of what we're doing here in the U.S. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I was just thinking about back to the framework conversation that you described earlier, and and figuring out how to pull little pieces of that in terms of of you know mental health recognition and and things of that nature um, that you that you guys have developed in the field and apply that to people's experiences here um, and just creating creating those kinds of, of, uh, you know, resources for people. Um, th that's kind of some of the stuff that comes to mind for me. Right. We've, uh, we've had, um, interest from, from schools. That's, that's where we've, we've tried to kind of pilot a similar model, uh, students, teachers, Administrators, you know, they they do have some social workers, kind of the same 
composite uh, trio of support that focuses on the student. Although, although we, we hit uh, two, two main kind of roadblocks, if you will, we've made headway in several districts, but, but they, they say that teachers, first of all, aren't qualified to, to be providing okay. um, such support. And, and second, there was some reticence concerning having a screening questionnaire that was administered to all students. Um, my thought with that is once, once you administer that, then you have a telltale sign of what students are experiencing. And I think, I think there's some fear that there might be more um, impacts of mental health than, than kind of initially presumed. So kind of opening that up that can of worms, but not necessarily having adequate supports to address it. There was quite a bit of reluctance with that. So those, those are the two main feedbacks we've heard over right. and over again with schools. Um, so, so there's certainly other populations, I think, that, that would maybe be a, a better fit. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that that, that that institutional knowledge that you have has sort of a universal appeal in terms of of you know some of the things that it sounds like you're teaching in uh in uganda itself to try and help with awareness and help you know people understand um some of the challenges that that are being that are being exemplified or manifested through mental health um you know challenges um and and so that's i think more what i was getting to in terms of of the ability to for you to take some of that information and educate the public in general, just around, around mental health, that mm-hmm. then creates a, um, a situation where they um, see you as kind of the, an expert in, in this space. And then they start to, to want to engage with you in terms of just, you know, seeing what you're up to in, uh, in, in your main mission. And Stu, if it's okay, I'll ask you a quick question about that. I, I think that's a great idea. Kind of off the cuff, what what do you think might be a good vehicle to do in that? Is that is that workshops? Is that is that um, um, yeah? Is that is that Zoom? I mean, I'm not not what what would be a, an effective way to to kind of making myself uh, an established voice, if you will, yeah, in, in all the noise <laughs> um, that, so that's happening. I think the that the that just getting the information out there in any form is kind of the first step and creating. Um, so typically what we would, what we would look to do is figure out how to attract people to your organization. And one of the ways that we might want to do that is sort of outside of this idea that you're trying to immediately bring them in as a donor or a volunteer or, you know, whatever capacity that, that you might, your end goal might be, but just create materials and create resources for people to get to know your organization and understand how you guys fit into this kind of global ecosystem of, um, of, of mental health care. And so certainly creating materials that talk about, you know, your mission and talk about your success stories are, are great. And so those could be um, infographics or, or just kind of case studies or, or story-based, um, you know, blog posts and things of that nature. But what I was thinking was perhaps taking some of the, this learning that you've, um, established and that you've created in terms of, of awareness. So let's just talk about mental health awareness, um, to start. So within your curricula, that you roll out in Uganda, you, there's a, a segment or a section of that curricula that talks about how to identify when people are are having a, a mental health episode or if they have, you know, chronic mental health challenges. Um, at least I'm based on the what you said earlier. I'm guessing you have a component of that teaching that has has that as as part of that curricula. Just taking that piece of of information and rolling it out to just help people here or wherever they might be able to engage and just, you know, top 10 things to look for, um, to, to, um, understand or, or if you suspect someone has depression, for example, and then that could just become a PDF Mm -hmm. 
that people are drawn to um, to your site. So you you put it out there in all in social media and maybe create a blog post about it, just talking about it in general, and say, hey, if you want to learn more, here's our here's our uh, our worksheet on on things to look for, um, you know, to help spot depression. Then essentially try to get that. Uh, in exchange for an email address as you're trying to build your your list, then that person now has a connection with you. Um, you've given them something of value. They've given you something of value. But right now you're just building a relationship. And so and so what you've done is you've is you've created this um, you've you've become this resource and you're in their mind as somebody who gave them something that was beneficial for them. And so just something like that is what I'm, what I'm sort of considering in terms of, of a, you know, a device to just start building those, those relationships and, and, you know, building those connections. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's great. Because I'll, I'll jump on your point, getting someone to commit hard earned dollars from the mm-hmm. get go is a heavy lift. But I like, I like what you're proposing kind of brokering. Now, how how can we help you? Or, or hello, this this is what what we can offer. These are some tips or some facts, and just spark a conversation, and then from that, use that as a stepping stone to then bridge a possible donation. But don't don't you know jump from rung yeah. one to rung five without actually hitting. Yeah, exactly. Three, it's four. Um, you know, it's kind of like you, you know, you're 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 trying to date somebody and you see somebody that you think is neat and you've maybe never met them and you <laughs> walk up to them and ask them to marry you. That doesn't usually work real well. <laughs> so just creating these little opportunities. And one of the things that one of my coaches and, and mentors taught me is that relationships are interactions. The, the formula for a relationship is a relationship is an inner is interactions over time. And so you increase the number of interactions mm-hmm. and, increase or maybe it's interactions times time. Um, but in, in any event, it's, um, you know, as you increase those things, that relationship grows. And so, you know, if you've had one conversation with somebody, the, you know, the likelihood that they're going to enter into uh, a long-term lasting relationship with you is, is pretty low. But if you've had some back and forths and if you've exchanged information and you've, and particularly if it, if you come at it from this idea of, of value exchange, that is where kind of that gold starts to happen in terms of, and and you don't have to be manipulative about this. If, if your, if your intention is just to help people with the end goal of helping people in Uganda with Mm -hmm. their mental health, um, but you come at it from that, from that perspective of altruism and that perspective of, I'm, I'm just trying to help here and, and create opportunities to, you know, ask questions and get feedback and, and, you know, give them something of value and, and they give you something of value in terms of email addresses or, um, you know, or even just asking for small donations, you know, those can then escalate to larger donations or you get somebody on board who, who's like, okay, well that was, that was informational. And, you know, maybe, maybe you get a, a, a U.S. based psychiatrist on board with, with the idea that, okay, I, I like what this organization is doing. Um, I'm going to give them you know, a one-time donation. And then you can go back to that person and ask them for a a recurring donation, or maybe they then volunteer to go help train some people in Uganda. And, you know, all of a sudden you've, you've built this really huge stable foundation on which to, to grow that, um, that relationship as opposed to just coming at it from, you know, give me some, give me some money right up front. Right. I like it. I like it. I, I think, I think you're hitting on all, on all the good points here. I'm taking some notes as, uh, as you're speaking, although I know you're recording this and I can go back to it. Yeah, for sure. Just, notes. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, that's what we look at marketing as. And, and certainly there's very transactional marketing that happens where, um, you know, you're selling widgets or, or, you know, a food item or, or whatever. And someone's walking down the street and, and they, they see that hot dog cart over there and they say, well, I'm hungry. So I'm going to just go and give this guy my money and, and, uh, get a, a hot dog in exchange. And so that, that's a very low, um, 
I don't want to say value, but it's a, it's a low barrier to entry relationship that's being built there. Um, I need something. You have this thing that you're selling that I need. Let's let's exchange uh, value here. Um, but when you start talking about really strong relationships, um, that's where, for example, that same hot dog vendor could, you know, ask you what you want on the on the hot dog and and put extra stuff on and ask you your name and you know or maybe you know give you some additional item uh you know just for being a customer or because it's you know hot dog wednesday or whatever and so all of a sudden there's opportunity to create a return on you know a return relationship so it's like well you know, now I know that when I'm hungry for lunch, that that Jim and his hot dog stand are down the street, and I'm going to go um, go back there. And and so when when you are looking at at these opportunities to engage people, if you can kind of come at it from this perspective of I, I want to build a relationship and I want to help uh, this person, you know, fulfill this need that they have, which might be to help or it might be to understand um but you know if you're really coming at it from that perspective of it's not just a one-time transaction it's this is a you know this is a, a friend that i'm trying to create um that that are you know may help me out may know somebody who can help me out even more um that's where i think you know a lot of a lot of businesses both for-profit and non-profit kind of potentially miss miss the mark mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. I, I, you know, I'd lean off when you were making that hot dog reference. I completely got it. That was that was actually my first job. I was a hot dog vendor salesman. So as you were talking about that, I was nodding my head here and completely. Yeah, and it agree. doesn't mean that. So one of the other things, and this was on a show earlier this year, and and you want to make sure, or or it's a good idea to to always have kind of what what your ask is in mind. Um, and again, you know, coming at it from a, a perspective of, of altruism and, and being real, you know, being real about it and not being, you know, not trying to trick somebody into, into anything, but always with the idea that, that, um, and this was a, just a great quote that I loved, which was that the answer is always no, if you don't ask. And so whatever that next step might be, whether that's, you know, do you want to hop on a call and talk about this? Or would you like for me to send you more information? Or, um, you know, would you be, would you be able to, um, you know, to donate $5 today? Um, unless you ask, the answer is always going to be no. So really keeping that in mind as well. And, you know, with that big picture perspective of, of the idea here is trying to create a, a relationship and try and build a really strong connection. I, uh, I, I also love that quote. I, I often uh, use it in examples too. So, so it's a one, one that I completely agree with you on too. So I have a few questions about, about the beneficiaries of, of your services, since there's such a stigma in country um, in Uganda around, around mental health care. What, what's that like trying to get people on board with the idea that, that this is okay and that, and then people can help them. How's how's that message getting across? Yeah, no, that's that's a it's a phenomenal question. Initially, when we ran our pilot program, it was in the capital in Kampala. We we also rubbed up against that. In order for us to get someone, we we didn't want to necessarily say that they had a disorder or that they had an illness or a problem, or they were depressed, that, that's very intimidating to hear. So we tried to kind of couch it under terms that are a little bit more common, you know, stress, emotional well-being, um, stressors in our lives, being work or relationships. We, we had the opportunity where our counselors would actually speak to the general kind of outpatient uh, group that was waiting for a doctor, and they would just talk about anecdotes and stories, kind of a now, who who in the audience or who in the crowd here is is struggling to pay for their child's school fees? And you would see people kind of nod their head, 
like an agreement on who who in the audience is having a difficult time finding work and people would kind of nod their head. And then we would invite those folks like, hey, if this is a problem that you're experiencing, we'd, we'd love to talk with you about that. We'd love to see if we could learn a little bit more about your stressor and see if we could give you some more more skills. And that that was kind of our initial barrier uh, of entry, if you will. And, they, and it got folks to come. Um, now, now in Northern Uganda, we have the support of the district I think that lends a whole nother air of credibility um, that that we're not a foreign service, and with the district's uh, you know kind of approval, their green light, we're much more apt to we we people know us at that point. There we we we're, um, we're a resource that the community can can kind of call on in those times. But uh, I, I think you know quickly kind of recap that that language depression, mental illness disorder that's still something we're really cautious about. And we try and kind of catch it more under emotional well-being. Yeah, that's great. I love how you've figured out how to reframe the narrative in order to to make sure that you don't um, you don't scare people off, or you don't you don't create a, a bigger problem for somebody than than maybe they they had initially. So, right. you know, that leads me to think that you're you're actually pretty good at storytelling, um, and. <laughs> and that you that that you you may not have as big of a problem with that as as you currently maybe think that you have. I, I know you mentioned storytelling and getting the story out a little while ago, and it's really about trying to find ways to adjust the narrative to um, to mm. to hit to connect with and, and, and resonate with the target audience or, you know, the people that you're trying to reach at the right time. And, a lot, right. and, you know, there are a lot of cons- questions about that, but, you know, ideally you have this Venn diagram of, of right people, right message and right time. And, and where those overlap, that's where, that's where the, the real magic starts to happen. However, there there is overlap on the on the edges of that too, where you have the right people and the right message. It's just not the right time, or you have the right message and mm. the right time, but not the right people. And and so, really exploring all of those overlap opportunities, um, you know, or the right people and the right time with the wrong message. So, figuring out ways to be consistent with your outreach. Um, that starts to tackle that that right time problem. So a lot of times you'll hear <clears throat> about outreach and, and and advertising and marketing as you know there's always going to be a certain percentage of the people that that are right in the middle of that Venn diagram that it's the right message, it's the right time and it's the right person and and they're they're ready to buy um, or donate or whatever it is that you're trying to get them to do. And those, that's awesome when you can, when you can nail that. However, you know, let's say that's 10% just for, for uh, easy math. So out of every hundred people that you send that message to, 10 of them are going to bite and, and take the, take that and, and run with it and be, become, you know, part of your, your crew, um, you know, immediately. And 90% of those people either you know, weren't ready. So it wasn't the right time, or maybe it wasn't the right message. Um, or maybe they weren't the right people, but ultimately going back to those, to those groups and making sure that it's not just a one-time, um, proposition, um, you know, that you're getting that message and you're providing value and you're out on a regular basis being consistent around, around trying to connect with, with these people. Um, because, of the 90 people that are left, um, and hopefully you add 10 more, so let's get it back up to 100. But of the, that next batch of 100 people, there are going to be 10 of those people that are that are ready to go. So um, so it's, it really comes right. down to, from a messaging standpoint, is, you know, first of all, is being consistent and persistent. And then, you know, just trying things and, and understanding who you're trying to reach um, if you can get your arms wrapped around who it is you're trying to reach and and make sure that you're giving them what they need where they need it, for example, um, you know that that then becomes kind of the the next phase of that uh, 
of, of, of really maximizing your, um, your returns on those efforts. I like, I like a lot the right people message in time. That's, it's a really handy framework that I think kind of takes some of this abstract, some of this complex and really boils it down to something quite, quite simple. And, and, and I think really practical. Um, I, uh, think that I often think that I have the right people or have the message, but the time is incorrect. So I'm very persistent in following up, but I think playing and tweaking with, with each of those, I'll be really curious to see what, what kind of comes, comes to the surface. Yeah, and that's where you know tracking and making sure that you have a good understanding of what you, what you're doing, <laughs> and and all the data around what you're doing is becomes really important. Um, a, a lot of times, you hear the you know kind of the story about the you know the salesperson that went out and and called on this guy five times, but he wasn't tracking any of his any of his efforts and. So he he didn't really realize that that those people that he talked to seven times bought, and so he's you know he's mostly giving up after five. But if he just talked to everyone a couple more times, they'd be you know they'd be ripe for uh, you know for whatever it was that that person was selling, and and you know in the nonprofit space, it's a it's a different discussion and it's a different uh, a different approach in a lot of respects, but, but a lot of times it is really just understanding how much, how many touches you need to take somebody, you know, to that next phase of your relationship. And it may be that, that when you start tracking things, you can start to see where certain audiences respond after, after, you know, four engagements and other audiences require eight or 10 and and it might be worth pursuing the eight to ten audiences because they tend to give more, for example. So that's where kind of analytics and and really trying to to understand you know everything that went into each of these each of these relationships that, that you're trying to build becomes really really handy and really effective um, and really important. And it's a challenge when, you know, I don't know how big, how big is your team? Is it just, just you kind of doing all of that work or do you have team members? Yeah, no, just, just me here in, in the U S a uh, board, some volunteers, our, our team in Uganda, the counselors and the nuclear team is maybe 22, but, but not, I'm the one, the one here who's kind of responsible for a lot of that. Well, let's see. So I'm trying to think of good tools to, to recommend. So, yeah, I was just gonna, I was just going to ask you that. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> well, I think I think most most organizations can could benefit from leveraging a, 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 a what's called a customer relationship management tool or a CRM. Um, there are you know a, a whole bunch to choose from um, that range in price from you know virtually free for a certain number of, of um, entries all the way up to be incredibly expensive. And I don't think that you have to uh, buy the most expensive one to get, to get what you need out of it. One of the things that I came up with, with when I was first exploring a, a CRM for my business was, you know, the, the best CRM is the one that you're going to use. And, um, and that's not, you know, uh, I didn't make that up necessarily. Um, but ultimately if you buy a hammer and you never take it out of the, out of the toolkit, it's not worth anything. So really the idea being that 
the best thing you can do is is leverage a tool like that to try and track people and understand their behavior and and just use it and if if it ends up you know five years from now that the one that you chose or or even a year from now that the one that you chose is a little bit clunky then you can you can try it a new one but the the best advice I can give is to just just pick one and and commit to using it so be in there be adding people to that to that tool and and make sure you have a good understanding of of you know how many emails did you have to send um you know Janice to get her to to you know take the next step whatever that step might be and then you can just start to pull out data and and get a better understanding of what's working and what's not and it just helps it helps streamline helps streamline things a lot and and that knowledge becomes incredibly powerful for you um so i would look at yeah, look at a, yeah. at a a tool like that and in the absence of of a tool you know just make sure you're tracking things even in a spreadsheet and just say okay you know this is this is this person who um either reached out to us and and figure out how to how to track how how they first came into your you know into your area um and then um you know, get an understanding of you know you sent them this email on this date and and you know, met them at a conference on this date and did this other thing and and just really looking at that relationship and getting a good understanding as to what what all the steps were um and and that's kind of the first um the first piece of that puzzle right 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 no there's there's incredible value in that i and, and it requires a whole lot of discipline and and diligence to to kind of keep with that. I can imagine you know, having a Rolodex of hundred plus people, if if not more, and constantly kind of keeping track of what email and so forth and so on. That that can be a little bit meticulous, but but if it's done well, it's it's a gold mine for for what 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 it can be kind of offering you. Yeah, and the you know the the Rolodex is a great um, old school example of 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 that. Um, you know, a, a lot of times people would write information about, about this particular, um, contact, you know, on that, on, on their, on their sheet, they'd know when their birthday was or what their child, children's names were or things of that nature. And, a, you know, a CRM is just a higher tech version of that. Now, you know, the next thing that's nice about, about a, a decent content relations management tool is that. Um, there's a lot of automation opportunities that are kind of packaged into most of these. So it does give you an avenue to, to send bulk emails and put people into, um, you know, into, into mailing lists that, that have auto responders and things of that nature. So you can get very um, sophisticated and, and technical around it. I would say the first step again is just, just choosing one and, and committing to using it. Got it. Got it. Got it. I will, uh, I'll be on yeah. the hunt for, for something. Useful. Yeah. And I, I would look at, you know, I think insightly has, has one that is, that is decent and inexpensive. Um, my company okay. uses one called Zoho, which, you know, it, there's a definitely a cost associated with it. Um, you know, you can get very expensive Salesforce is like an enterprise level, uh, CRM. That's amazing, but is, is fairly expensive. Um, you might look at, at Civicore, C-I-V-I-C-O-R-E. They actually were purchased a couple of years ago and I cannot remember the name of the company that bought them, but they are a, a, a CRM and, and automation tool that was built specifically for, um, for nonprofits. So I, I bet if you do a search That's for Civicore, you can find what their, their new name is. Great, great. Thank you for that. I appreciate the suggestion. Sure. Um, so that's uh, so you have a, a several constituents that you're that you're trying to reach, um, and some of them are more challenging to reach than others, and and are in and outside of the country. It's you know, it's definitely really pretty cool what you guys are doing in terms of helping bring. Um, you know, mental health care to, to those that, that just don't have that ability to, to access that stuff. 
Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, it's uh, much appreciated, really. I, I, I know how access to mental health care has categorically transformed my life. And uh, it's exciting to know that we're doing our small part for, for folks who don't have any access to anything to, to kind of uplift and provide that. You know, we'll, we'll wrap up this year with a little over 2,400 counseling sessions since March, uh, which, which is incredible and exciting. And you know, albeit COVID, we've, we've still been able to kind of do, do the good work and fight the good fight. Yeah, that's fantastic. How many, how many people, so in, in Uganda, in country, you said there's, you have a team and then there are roughly, I do roughly 30 psychiatrists in, in country. And then how many, how many people have you engaged to be part of kind of this group, um, you know, counseling? Yeah, we have, uh, we have 18, uh, community mental health workers and those 18, they're, they're kind of the, the warriors, if you will, they're the front line, and we're, we're looking to, to grow that next year, certainly hopefully to double that amount. Um, I think, I think that's, that's kind of the, the turnkey with this model is that you can take anyone who has the time, the enthusiasm, the zeal for, for this work. And within five days and you know, appropriate supervision, that particular person can actually provide basic care. I think often our kind of our, our challenge point is, is there a referral arm in the community when someone does come to us with you know, schizophrenia or psychosis or, or our help isn't enough? We, we never want to leave someone stranded because that, that would leave them in a worse place than they came to us. So that's, that's the challenging part uh, of identifying that partner who, who could be willing to receive patients that we refer to them. Right. Gotcha. Wow. That's amazing, though, that you have 18, 18 kind of citizen counselors who've seen 2,400 people in the last nine months. That's, that's remarkable. Yeah. That's, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> So I, I mean, it's been almost an hour and this has just flown by and I, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. How, how would people find you if they wanted to help support Find Mind? What, what's the best way for them to get in touch? The, the best way is to go to our website, uh, www.afindmind.org. Go there, explore. There's some great videos, and then our social media channels are also at the bottom too. Awesome. And I'd like to end these with an with an ask in terms of an action item. So if if our listeners today, if you could ask them to take one action to make the world a better place, or to just be more engaged, or to do to do one thing after listening to to our show today, what what would you ask them to do? <laughs> that's such a good question. I'll, I'll say the first thing that came to my mind, and that's um, wh whoever's home with you, whether that's your mom or your brother or your sister, just go up to them and give them a hug. Um, simple as that. Just just go so show, show some affection, show some love to, to those who uh, you're with. Well, I think that's great. I, I definitely have found myself missing. Uh, I'm a bit of a hugger, and I've, I've been missing that over the, over the course of this year. So um, I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll go give my wife a hug after our, after our show here. So thanks again for being on. Um, you know, I, again, I think it's great what you're doing and, and really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me today and look forward to hearing how, how things go. There you have it, another great episode of Relish This. Thanks for listening. If you would like to learn more about how to apply the audience engagement cycle to expand your organization's mission, there are two things you can do. Right now, you can go to missionuncomfortablebook.com to download a copy of my book. While you're there, you can get your purpose-driven marketing score to see where you can unearth some gold for your organization. If you would like to listen to back episodes of the show or sign up to be a guest, go to relishstudio.com slash podcast. That's it for this week. I'll be back next week with another great episode of Relish This.